Yeah, it's good to think about that. Uh, you and I and many other people already know that there's so many reasons the University of Vienna is not going to recognise my qualifications. <laughs> and this actually then does put me in an interesting position for introducing myself here. Yes, I have uh, degrees from different uh, universities in the UK, degrees from Universities of Edinburgh and University of Sheffield. They have the word archaeology in them. Um, I got my PhD from a, a school of history, classics and archaeology. I will sometimes, especially when in nice familiar surroundings like this, call myself an archaeologist because that's, that's easy shorthand for things that I once did. I did once, once upon a time dig holes in the ground. Ah, but I'm equating digging holes in the ground to archaeology. That is not all that archaeology is. Thinking about things, my personal experience of how I've been validated by my professional associations. Okay, to get to, to IFA, to get up to become a member of, member to be a practitioner, to be an associate, to be a member of IFA. Yeah, I did need a degree was helped for a little bit of shortcut, but the things that were actually evaluated did have to do with archaeological work I'd done in the past, rather than validating my academic work. I seem to remember the most enormous, most dull, fantastically long um, death-based assessment. Death-based assessment of the route of the Sheffield Ring Road North Extension. Oh, it was so heavy. Um, and, and I think that got, that got brought into validation and weighed and approved and, and so on. <laughs> but then, for my other professional association memberships, I'm so delighted that RPA are about to be speaking straight after me. I am wearing my RPA pin to show that I am a registered professional archaeologist. My membership of RPA was based on having a PhD. Okay, so I have masters as well, but it was my I presented the I think I presented the table of contents of my PhD, and that was accepted. Oh, that PhD, as Ray pointed out, in Austria wouldn't look like a, an archaeology PhD. There is so little of it that is about human life in the past. It's about how people work in archaeology and a little history of a contemporary history of archaeology in the UK, but it's not actually about life in the past. I think the phrase Iron Age might appear in there once just to describe our <laughs> site and pottery, yeah, not really. But that said, if I tried to do that, that present that PhD, if I tried to do that in the Department of Sociology, because I'll sometimes call myself a sociologist, they would equally have laughed at this and said, what nonsense is this? This doesn't fit. The one, but well, bizarrely, I do have one, one more um, professional membership that does relate to my work and to my academic work. I am a certified member of the Market Research Society. And that is because and at my, my route to certified membership of the MRS, which is actually the most useful in terms of getting money in, most useful of my professional memberships. And uh, that was about, again, that was because I'd done, I'd done a PhD, but I did a PhD that was a PhD by, by research publication, and it was publishing these big uh, market research surveys that I'd done of professional archaeology that showed a methodology for doing that and showed results produced by that methodology. And so it was both academic and work that proved to the Market Research Society that it was a suitable person to join that professional institute. This is a little bit of a digression from what we're really talking about. <laughs> what do you mean you don't recognize my qualifications? Okay, now, discovering the archeologist of the world, we're thinking here, I'm talking about archeology span all around the world. Okay, it, by, by necessity, it's going to focus quite tightly on some parts of the world rather than it being going through each country by country saying, in Albania, in Algeria, right? But the, it's thinking about the ways that things are done differently. Now, there was this publication, this was an issue of Archaeologies, which is the Journal of World Archaeological Congress. I'm sure you all subscribe and read and enjoy such publications, but there is already some stuff out there about this. And some of what I've put into that was an underpinning idea that there's been this labor market research done, which I'll talk about a little bit in UK and Europe and some other parts of the world. I'm talking about the idea that in theory, it could all be brought together into some super macro project where we constantly were able to update 
how many archaeologists are working in different countries around the world, what they were doing, what archaeology is in Albania, in Algeria, what qualifications you need, how people can, in theory, move from one place to another. So I'll start by talking a little bit, expanding a little bit more on what Ray has already said about Europe. You mentioned pr protected professions. Professions, there are professions in Europe, in the UK, in, around the world, where it is a protected title. Not everyone can go around claiming, saying, I am an architect, I am a doctor, medical doctor, etc. Archaeologist is a protected title in these six countries, bizarrely protected twice in Hungary, which I've not quite worked out. <laughs> my, my, my reading Hungarian doesn't help me at all, following, following links there. In each of these six countries, the profession, the title archaeologist, of course, uh, archaeologos or archaeolog, is protected by the state heritage agency or more, even more often by the Ministry of Culture or the Ministry of Culture and Education or uh, in where? In Hungary, actually, by the Prime Minister's office, but it is protected by government. So government wants to protect these things. It is from very much from the top. It is not coming from archaeologists. This is different from everything Ray said about getting licenses to lead an excavation. Excavation is not archaeology. Yes, it is. Excavation is not all archaeology. But this is something different from the, the licensing requirements. So thinking about what the uh, Discovering the Archaeologists of Europe projects have done. Ten years ago, 2006 to 2008, we looked at how many archaeologists are working in this swathe, of, this diagonal swathe of countries across, across Europe. And at that time, we found that there were many more jobs in the countries in northwest of Europe, but they didn't pay so much as the jobs in the southeast of Europe, because the countries in the northwest of Europe on this map had commercial archaeology. And if you were an archaeologist working in Cyprus, it meant you worked for the state and you were a, a well-paid and respected civil servant. But there were so very, very few jobs. There were thousands of jobs in Britain, in Ireland. And this was at the time, this was just before the crash. This was at the height of the boom. There were so many jobs and people were moving around Europe so much. At that time, in 2006, 45% of archaeologists in the island of Ireland were not from the island of Ireland. People were moving around, people were coming in, into Britain as well. We repeated that project with a few more countries five years later in a kind of where are we now after the crash. And that produced uh, interesting yet painful information about the number of places where, where jobs had been lost, like so many of those jobs in Ireland. And uh, similar things that had happened in Spain and Italy, uh, I mean, yes. Uh, you know very well what is what happened in in Spain, and the but this meant that we were seeing the mobility of archaeologists, the the ability of people. Now, was it the ability of people to get a job in a different country from the their country of origin that had disappeared, or were there just less jobs, and so it was always inherently difficult for people to move around and get jobs. The one thing that we found, apart from the the need for those licensing systems to, in order to be able to run an excavation, which are often, it's not just the idea that you need to have a degree in archaeology, it's often written in really quite a chauvinistic way, that you have to have a degree in archaeology and you have to have an understanding of the archaeology of, let's just say, at random Ireland. That it's very much about controlling who does that. And I remember it's being done by the state agencies and they're doing it and they're controlling, they're saying it is only Irish archaeologists that can tell the story of Ireland, and the same thing applies elsewhere. We are now hoping and planning to do uh, a repeat of this this project. Um, our first ambitions we, we were trying to talk to so many people in so many different countries that that narrowed down a little bit, and even so, this is still this is still a little bit more ambitious than we're going to do. But there is there has been an application for funding made by um, her, her doctor professor Raymond Carl of the University of Bangor to try and get money to do a new Discovering the Archaeologist of Europe. It isn't going to get all those countries. It's not going to get Romania. It is going to get Bulgaria. Not going to get Malta. Not going to get all of Fenoscandia, the Norway, Sweden, Finland. Not going to get France. 
but uh, I see in the room the, the designated Dutch researcher and I see the designated Spanish researcher are here to hear about the, the possibilities of this. So we're hoping to be able to build up the picture again to see where European archaeology is in terms of opportunities, in terms of the way it works in different countries. This is, of course, not just a Discovering the Archaeologist of Europe presentation. This is thinking about uh, elsewhere in the world. Ah, and before I said that, of course, I had this slide to say. Right, let's go back one. <coughs> it, doesn't, it really doesn't want to go back one. Yes, it does. Okay. Thinking about the way that archaeology is structured across that map. Again, in the northwest especially, things are more commercial up in the northwest. Uh, in Central Europe, things tend to... Yeah, no, there's increasing commercialization in archaeology in countries like Slovakia and Czech Republic and Hungary. Um, but in Central Europe, it tends towards there being the, the Grand Academy of Sciences model, almost a state agency that, that runs things, that maybe devolves some responsibility to other bodies, but it tends to be really quite centralized. In Southeast Europe, even more so, even more state controlled. And uh, as I remember, everything that is about who gives out licenses and who protects the, the title archaeologist is being done by states. It is not being done by professional associations. Because we are all here at CIFA conference, I automatically then assume we are all pro professional associations and think that this responsibility should be given to archaeologists, not to bureaucrats in Whitehall or equivalent around the, the continent. And so professional associations are a route to regulating who can call themselves an archaeologist. But as we've already seen in terms of licensing and protected titles have had no, no impact on that. On that map there are good professional associations I would say in UK, in Ireland, in Netherlands and uh, proto or associations no uh, Hungary actually was quite was okay for a while but proto organizations in Portugal in Spain and Italy but it, they're not really professional associations like this is and there are some arguments about why professional associations are not the best route forward in all of Europe there is a perception held by some that this is often Anglophone, often um, Northwest Euro European, Atlanticist, uh, free trade, Milton Friedman, Margaret Thatcher kind of attitudes. Let me give you a little quote, which I have to read off paper. A little quote, this is a quote from a publication public, published in 2010, edited by Nathan Schlanger and myself, called Archaeology and Crisis, Archaeology and the Economic Crisis. It's a paper by Jean-Paul Desmoulins, who was head of INRAP, essentially the state, the French state service for doing archaeological fieldwork. And he said, Code of Ethics. Code of Ethics is a noble notion that might be relevant or applicable in some, brackets, possibly Protestant countries in Western Europe, but it is not pertinent to be realistic in many parts of our continent and in much of the world. <laughs> Such a code supposes, in fact, a shared commitment to strong scientific control, which does not seem to be the case, for example, with the first attempts at introducing commercial archaeology in France, Demo 2010. The suggestion that professional associations are just not right for, for some of Europe because of cultural traditions, whether those cultural traditions are about not... Mm, not embracing all that the Enlightenment brought and relying on a, a strong control with the strong traditions of that being whether that is state or church control and somehow that is an antithesis to having professional associations is to me an odd and alien view but as a would-be sociologist of professions is very interesting to realize that people think like that some people do think like this and it might not it would be very difficult, it would be inappropriate for us to try and impose a professional associations kind of model everywhere. This is, we are not doing this through cultural, cultural uh, colonialism. No. Digression aside, elsewhere in the world, the idea of finding out how many archaeologists work in the countries of the Americas, and this is not just the United States, there's an idea that's about 
North and South and Central and Caribbean America is something that the Society for American Archaeology has been interested in for quite a while, in association, in a little bit of association with RPA and ACRA, and it's been talked about for a while. There has been some work done in the past, maybe our colleagues, I'm not going to steal any thunder from our RPA colleagues to think about archaeology in North America. There has been a little bit of work done on thinking about how many archaeologists work in Latin America. This, now, this was, this was put together by <coughs> SAA Committee on Archaeology in the Americas. It's kind of best guesses from people in, in these countries about oh, how many people are there. Are, is it normal to work for someone who is an archaeologist to work in academia or in contract archaeology, in commercial applied archaeology? And you can see there, in Latin America, South America, it is normal for archaeology to be contract. It is normal for it to be applied archaeology. Uh, the most interesting one on there, I think, is actually is Peru, where there's been a concordat between uh, Peruvian and US archaeology to think about the way that things can happen. So this is just a little insight into the ways that things happen in South America. Now, just to jump back and use Europe as, uh, as a hook to hang everything else on, the main obstacle to getting work in different European countries for Europeans, yeah, a little bit about licensing, not so much. It's about language. That's why there are very few UK archaeologists working in other countries in Europe, because we are rubbish at languages. <laughs> Generalization, true. Um, but also is the reason why there were many uh, archaeologists from other countries working before the crash in the UK and especially in Ireland because graduates, and they would normally be graduates, will be coming in with very good English and are able to fit in and work in these countries. The technicalities of how to dig a hole do not differ so enormously from country to country. A bit, yes, I see some, some, some <laughs> heads being shook around there in the middle of the room, but it's, it's true. Yeah. Okay, no, I mean, yeah, okay, ooh, a slide, slides of German sites with spade flat, oh, yeah, anyway, but the... Artificial levels, you mean. Oh! <laughs> that, this will be in the paper I'm giving on Friday. Uh, the, <laughs> but language was the main barrier. So there's an idea about working in, in Latin America, and again, the, the obstacle is, is language. It's, these, these are going to be jobs that are only really going to be available if you can speak Spanish or Portuguese or Dutch or French. Elsewhere in the world, elsewhere in the world, I've also been trying to think about the way that archaeology happens in Asia. It's difficult. There are some places where there is good information, good detailed information. We will hear very shortly about Japan. I say, looking at the author of the next slide you're about to see, I wanted to try and find out about archaeology in Japan and in East Asia because there the, well, the system is different. I wanted to find out about archaeology in Southeast Asia where uh, often there is a certain level of commercialization with it going hand in hand with strong central state heritage agencies. I'd, I had a little fantasy about trying to do uh, discovering the archaeologists of the Himalaya and the Hindu Kush, but no, that never quite got anywhere to find out about how many archaeologists there really are in Bhutan. It was not really going to be much of, a, much of a great project. But as I say, in Japan, there are good data. There are good data, and I'm, I'm, I would like to thank uh, Katsu at the back of the room, who didn't know I was about to put this, this <laughs> slide up. This comes from a paper that Katsuo Kamura and colleagues gave at WAC last year, thinking about how, why th th there are a lot of archaeologists in Japan, or uh, shall we say, experts for buried cultural properties. And the way that it, uh, things work in Japan is, is, has been a history of archaeological management rules and legislation have always been in response to economic growth and to economic changes in Japan. And the, the top graph up there is about the amount of money that was being spent on fieldwork in Japan. Now, of course, remember Japan, that, that peaks in 1999, 2000. Japan then had a lost decade, and now into a second lost decade economically. And also the number of jobs flattened out, but then began to fall off. And it just it identifies the links between economic investment and work. It, that 
slide that Katsu has put down, the one on the right there, about nicely matching the number of jobs in Japanese archaeology against the number of jobs in UK archaeology, is a, an interesting one to think about peaks and troughs of the economic cycle. They don't really have very much to do with archaeology. It just emphasizes how much economy has the influence it has on working in the sector. But the other very interesting thing about Japanese archaeology, which we discussed last year in Japan, is about an aging workforce. If you remember those, those graphs where, the, where there was like lots of archaeologists and it stuck at a certain level for a while, and that's because no one was no one was getting out and no one was coming in. People were just getting older in their in their jobs, and now Japanese archaeology approaches a point where there are so many archaeologists that are getting close to the end of their careers, and there will be such a gap. And the problem. I think that my reading of the problem there in Japanese archaeology is that Japan, not just Japanese archaeology, but Japan culturally is very reluctant, very resistant of the idea of foreigners coming in to work. It is not, this is not widely embraced as a concept in Japan, whereas I see it as, of course, I see it as the perfect route to solving the, the problem of there being a shortfall of, of workers, of skilled workers. Again, not being able to speak Japanese will be a, a hindrance to anyone fancying doing that, but it's a realistic possibility. The other place where there are good data about employment in archaeology is in Australia, where uh, Sean Ulm and Geraldine Matte and colleagues have done a, also a series of kind of labour market research projects. Uh, there's been that, that fun book there, um, Digging up down under, which is is essentially a guide for how how for pommies can go and get a job in Australia. And then, as we learned at the opening session just this morning, Australian visa rules for people coming in to work in Australia have been uh, visa rule four five seven, which I had never heard of before this morning's session, which I've now been reading stuff in the Australian papers about, detailing who can get a job in Australia. Archaeologists is on this vast list of of professions that you just you can no longer tick on the box to say I'm coming to Australia to be an archaeologist. Irritatingly, I also can't, I can no longer tick I want to go to Australia to be a market researcher. <laughs> it's also on, on the list of things that archivists, so many things um, that are on their list as Australia, like so much of the world, looks is looking at the condition of the world today and is behaving in an isolationist manner. Uh, the Oh yeah, a last little one about Australia, just to show over time that's a good about the proportion of jobs is in government has been falling while the proportion of jobs in commercial, private, applied archaeology has been rising. Again, in all these parts of the world, it is the commercial applied archaeology sector which is where the most jobs are, where the most opportunities are for anyone choosing to, to move from country to country. And again, there's the that's the situation in archaeology. This is the qualifications that archaeologists hold. An undergraduate degree has essentially become the entry qualification, the unofficial entry qualification, like it is here. Yes, there are some people that get into UK archaeology without a degree, but essentially that's, that's the route in. Right, so with that cheerful review, oh, no, there's still some more of the world, isn't there? Um, Brief mention of archaeology in Africa. Archaeology in Africa, okay. Archaeology in Africa, historically, this is recent history, has been in three parts. It has been archaeology in Egypt, where there have been a lot of people working, and there has been archaeology in South Africa, where there is a commercialized system uh, not unlike in other English speaking countries around the world, where there was quite a lot of jobs. And between those two countries, there were so very, very few people working as archaeologists. And here's someone who's old boss, old boss I just quoted earlier in this presentation, but this is, this is not Jean-Paul Desmaux. So, the, um, <laughs> oh yeah, and here's one of, the, one of the editors of this book. Um, so, archaeology, in, in the vast bulk of Africa, there is, there is very little archaeology, but what does happen is that there might be jobs where there are the funding is coming from development banks, from the World Bank or other uh, African Development Bank or other development agencies which are doing something like an infrastructural project 
and that they will attach conditions to the funding that says that you must carry out all the following environmental requirements, and that includes historic environment. And so that, in, that means that archaeology, uh, the, the great one from precisely this book, was the Chad Cameroon pipeline. We're talking about the archaeology along, along the line of this enormous, ridiculously long linear route across a big chunk of Africa through countries which, at the start of the project, there were, uh, I think, uh, two archaeologists in Chad and three in Cameroon, or vice versa. And the project, but the project, as well as doing the, all of the, the work, it also had built into it a requirement to be training people as, as they went, training people in contemporary modern heritage management practices. And this is often the way that development bank funding projects will work, whether in Africa or in Asia or elsewhere in the world. So this is a route into the being, there, there is some work like this, but it, the work then goes to high level consultancies which manage the, this in partnership with training people in countries. So with that, I've, I had one more slide which I've decided to take out about uh, finding out about archeology span of Lusophone countries, the idea of doing a, trying to do a project that looked at every archeology span in all the countries that speak Portuguese around the world. Which, which is an interesting one because it would be a nice comparison between how archaeology happens in Portugal and Brazil and in so truly in de developed and developing and in undeveloped, less developed countries, Timor-Leste or um, Cabo Verde. But which we're actually talking about doing this as a, a potentially interesting project, the idea that these kind of these bits of research could be done. It doesn't have to be done in a geographical basis. It can be done on a shared cultural contact basis. So with that, there you go. What do you mean? You don't recognize my qualification. It's already been pointed out, but no, you don't. Thank you very much. <laughs>